Thank you very much, Paul. Hello. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. I'm honoured to be here among such uh, distinguished company. I'm also a proud parent of a second year student here, so I have a considerable attachment to SOAS. Um, I, uh, I'm very pleased <laughs> at that uh, introduction. I'm always very nervous about introductions, particularly since I uh, once hosted an event where I had to introduce Alistair Campbell, and beforehand he grabbed me by the lapels and said, what the hell are you going to say about me? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to say you are um, Tony Blair's former press spokesman. He said, oh, that's all right. Then he came up to the podium and he said, I'm very relieved at that kind of introduction, because last week I was in Leeds where they said, please welcome Alistair Campbell, the most evil man in Britain. <laughs> Um, anyway, to business now. For the next uh, hour and a half or so, we're going to discuss, debate, and consider the legacy of the so-called War on Terror. We'll be drawing upon the research and the expertise of our distinguished panel. As a British diplomat friend of mine said when he first heard the phrase War on Terror uh, being used by George W. Bush, he said, one can't help but think that declaring war on a tactic may be a mistake. Mr. Bush, as you will undoubtedly recall, made it clear that you're either with us or you are against us. And while Barack Obama doesn't share that Manichaean uh, approach and doesn't use the phrase war on terror, there have, been, there have been some policy changes, but there also has been considerable continuity. Guantanamo still exists, drone attacks take place. So the use of drones, as we will hear, has been particularly controversial. And we were discussing a little earlier, um, I was talking about being in Northern Ireland and starting my journalistic career there. And one of the clear lessons of the troubles in Northern Ireland was that you do not defeat what's called terrorism by killing one person that you think of as a terrorist and creating 100 others. And it seems a obvious lesson, really, but it seems to be also one that's rather difficult to, to learn. We'll be drawing on two, uh, the expertise of two leading SOAS thinkers, uh, Professor Gilbert Ashkar, who is, as you've been hearing, a Professor of Development Studies and International Relations and Chair of the SOAS Centre for Palestine Studies. Uh, Professor Ashkar's books include The Clash of Barbarisms, The Making of the New World Disorder, which has been translated into some 14 languages. We're also joined by Dr. Ashin Adib Magadam, who is Reader in Comparative Politics and International Relations and chair of the SOAS Center for Iranian Studies. And his most recent book on the Arab revolts and the Iranian revolution, power and resistance today, is the first comparative analysis of two central political events that have shaped our world, and in fact, continue to shape our world. The Arab, uh, Arab uprisings, which began in Tunisia, and the 1979 Iranian revolution. We'll also open up the discussions to uh, questions uh, and opinions from the floor, but we're going to begin with a great friend of SOAS, a friend of mine too, I'm proud to say, Professor Akbar Ahmed, who is, as you've heard, a SOAS alumnus, and he was formerly the Pakistan High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. He is indeed a world-renowned scholar, as well as a diplomat. The BBC did say he's the world's leading authority on contemporary Islam, and as I can testify the BBC rarely gets things wrong. Um, you may want to dispute that, but we'll do that afterwards. Um, Professor Ahmed's latest book uh, published this year is The Thistle and the Drone. The subtitle is How America's War on Terror Became a Global War on Tribal Islam. Drawing from 40 current case studies, Professor Ahmed argues that a decade on from the atrocities of 9-11, the US-led War on Terror has had a largely unrecognized adverse effect. It has exacerbated the already broken relationship between central governments and the tribal societies on their periphery. Before we come to the main discussion, I'd like to first share another aspect of uh, Professor Ahmed's work. He's also a playwright and a poet, and three of his plays have been staged in the Washington DC area. So I'd like to begin with uh, a reading of Professor Ahmed's poem at the Khaibar Pass, taken from his publication, suspended somewhere between a book of verse. At the Khyber Pass, there's nothing spectacular or even dramatic in the climb or the mountains, but the air is almost tense in its silence, so insolently indifferent to me and my times. Here, all is awe and hush. Far beyond the pass, Kabuls and Samarkands, 
all that the urban imagination conjures in nostalgia, the mainsprings of conquest that flooded the fat lands this side of the pass, Delhi and Agra, the irresistible lakes of journey's end. The year strains to hear and almost does the distant din of battle, the clang and clamor of men at war, steel ringing on steel, cries of death and victory of hooves galloping hard from war for the secret treasures of the Ganges. Kingdoms rising as swiftly as the stroke of a scimitar and vanishing as swiftly. These putty-colored mountains seem to suggest with supreme indolence. You who would stride and strut and swear, look on us and wonder. They say there was an empire once, and that recently, on which the sun never set. Today, its legacy is a toy train, some cement blocks in tidy heaps to stop German tanks, if you please, and some insignia and escutcheons scratched like military badges on the shoulders of wayside rocks. Fading and exotic memories of Gurkha and Sikh Plump, open-mouthed lizards sitting so still they could be part of the regimental emblem. Like wind they came, like water they left. The thousands of soldiers, the thousands of years, passages long gone, long forgotten in this catacomb of desire and history. Afridi and Shinwari and before them old Tatara Watch from eagle eyes. O conqueror, gaze on these and wonder. O traveler, be warned and step softly. The hills seem to know and the air whispers. This evanescent journey, this mad rush will continue, will remain as desperate and as passionate as of yore. But to this end we must come. Silence beyond and silence behind. To this end, teasing imagination leads us and leaves us. Please will you welcome Professor Akbar Ahmed. Thank you, Gavin, for that uh, very warm introduction. Thank you, Director Paul Webley, distinguished panel and distinguished audience. I do want to thank those guests, many friends I see in the audience who've come from out of town. I do want to single out one person, and that is Zeba Salman, who invited me many, many months ago and has been such a great host. This, for me, is really an extraordinary honor to come back and be at Suez and address this occasion. Uh, about four decades ago, I had joined the Department of Anthropology, and it gives me particular delight to point out that my supervisor, Professor Adrian Mayer, is in the audience. And whatever I learned in anthropology was really due to his great uh, diligence and supervision. And what I learned about tribes was social structures, leadership, codes of honor, tribes living on borders, between borders, the interstices, tribes living along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. And in some senses, that is the focus of this particular study, the thistle and the drone. So in a philosophic sense, I have come full circle. Or as Professor Mayer be tempted to say, Ahmed hasn't moved at all. He's on exactly the same spot where he was four <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> well, when I went back to Pakistan, having got my PhD, I discovered that there was a great air of suspicion around the subject. People associated with British imperialism, with the colonial enterprise. Until I began to discover the sources of Muslim social science, Ibn Khaldun, 
who gave us the cyclical theory of societies, tribe, state, rise and fall. Even before him, Al-Baruni, a thousand years ago, who wrote the classic on Indian society, Hindu society called Kitab al-Hind, today considered a classic. And here I must acknowledge my friend Jonathan Benthel, who as director of the RAI invited me to write a paper on Al-Baruni as the first anthropologist. And you can imagine the storm that that created in the orthodox circles of anthropology. This book, of course, has drones in the title. But this is not a book about drones as such. Drones feature, but it is not about drones. It also raises issues of the modern state, of citizenship, of how we need to relate to one another in any society, of the war on terror, of security, of defining terrorism. And above all, to me perhaps the most important issue it raises is how do you really deal with someone or some communities that don't speak your language, may not have the same skin color as you, who may even have a very different social structure. And this takes us back to the first time in history when we hear the word barbarian coming from the ancient Greeks. And the definition, if you recall, really is someone who speaks a different language. You can't understand that language. Barbar. -bar. And the barbarian is defined as barbarian, primitive, savage. And over time, that confrontation between the Athenians and the barbarians grew into a confrontation between Greece and Persia, and over time between Europe and Asia and Christianity and Islam. And you can see how much of this, as it were, is in history and how it influences us even today. Because when 9-11 happened <clears throat> and commentators looked around and said, how do we make sense of this world? Well, there was a theory. And Professor Bernard Lewis, another famous uh, scholar from Suez, had written about the clash of civilizations. It was a phrase, his phrase. And instantly, this became the meta-narrative of our world. This was a clash of civilizations because for 2,000 years, Europe, Christianity, the West has been in a clash with the East, particularly Islam. <clears throat> in this case, certainly Islam. Now what this dangerously simplistic theory does is erase all differences, all identities into one global configuration, the other. So ethnicity, tribe, sect, religion, nationality are all erased in the definition of the other in the clash of civilizations. So the question was, certainly for me after 9-11 sitting in Washington DC in the front rows of the drama, how do you approach the other? I was involved in interfaith dialogue with the bishops and the rabbis. I was involved with the think tanks, the international relations, security issues. And yet I found myself going back again and again to anthropology, to the study of small societies, particularly the tribes. It allowed me to see communities as a whole, the economy, politics, religion, culture, rights to passage. It allowed me to fall back to cross-cultural studies. I look at one community here, one across the border, one on the next continent. Above all, it gave me some understanding of segmentary lineage systems, a specific kind of tribe within tribal societies. Tribes that are descended from a common ancestor, related to one another, find themselves on the linear charter, have highly developed codes of honor, and we can recognize them, and they have been documented. So the focus for me became tribal societies, segmentary lineage systems, and that became a key to enter the war on terror. And I also used history, journalism, and of course, popular culture. Those of you who keep up with popular culture, I'm sure would have come across a film called Thor. If you haven't, it is about the Greek, the Norwegian, sorry, not Greek, but the Norwegian god Thor, who actually descends to this planet from some planet in the outer universe. Now he's a tall, muscular, blue-eyed blonde. He lands somewhere in the Midwest in the United States and the security personnel, also muscular, blue-eyed, blonde, who get hold of him, interrogate him. And I was fascinated 
as a student of tribal societies, Muslim particularly tribal societies, at their line of questioning. The first question they asked him was, where did you get your training? Pakistan, Afghanistan, <laughs> Chechnya? <laughs> and the film, Thor, a popular film, and I must confess I was dragged there by my younger son, that suddenly gave me an insight how average people are looking at this problem. It has become so popular in culture that Muslim equals terrorism, particularly people from these societies. And we need to remember, going back to tribes, how profoundly tribal these societies remain. Entire countries, Saudi Arabia, named after a tribe. Waziristan, the area I was in charge of, named after the Wazir tribe. Balochistan, named after the Baloch tribes. Afghanistan, named after the Afghan or the Pashtun. That is the origin of the name. And now consider a fact. The drone strikes, the maximum drone strikes, have taken place in precisely what we are identifying as segmentary lineage systems. Pashtuns, Yemen, Somalia, the Kurds in East Turkey, now the Tuareg in West Africa. Immediate correlation. Now, if you take the title, the thistle and the drone, and look at these two symbols as metaphors for different kinds of society, you will see an immediate opposition, a binary opposition between tribal societies, the thistle, and the metaphor, of course, is borrowed from Leo Tolstoy's Haji Murad, uh, representing tribes with their codes of honor, bravery, culture, not prepared to just give in so easily. And we know it's the symbol of Scotland. Scots, again, have this great tradition of independence and nobility and an awareness of themselves as a people, uh, an independent, proud people. And the drone as a metaphor for the age of globalization. Sleek, unseen, comes from nowhere, destroys your lives and disappears again. Advanced kill technology. And in this study, as uh, my friend Gavin has pointed out, I have worked on 40 case studies, ranging from those in Morocco up to the Caucasus Mountains, and including the uh, groups in the southern Philippines, the Tauseg, often called the Moros, which is a derogatory term for them. I do want to here acknowledge my wonderful American team. Uh, two of them are here, Harrison and Frankie, who have been completely committed to this project and have contributed so significantly to it. Now, the 40 case studies identify four stages of growth, and this is important to follow. For the first thousand years, these societies are left alone. So they're tribal, they're also Muslim, and there's an easy balance between the two. There's a relationship very distant with the center. They're left more or less to their own devices. Then the 18th and 19th centuries, they encounter colonialism, European colonialism, and suddenly their lives change. Boundaries are imposed, rules are imposed. There are elements of genocide. We have all the details from authoritative sources. And suddenly, there's a challenge to their identity. And they look forward to the time they're independent or part of an independent nation, which is what begins to happen in the middle of the 20th century. So suddenly you have Muslim states emerging as independent post-Second World War modern states. And this is where, in a very profound sense, tragedy begins. Because in spite of the hopes and the aspirations of these people on the periphery, the central government, Libya, Iraq, Syria, treats the people on the periphery as brutally, if not worse, than the colonial past. Saddam and the Kurds, for example, you may recall the use of mustard gas. And then, of course, we have 9-11 and the post-9-11 world and the use of the drones. And this is where the US now gets involved with these very societies. So here's the picture. And these are 40 case studies, difficult to refute. Impoverished groups low levels of literacy already neglected, women virtually no rights in the tribal areas of Pakistan. The literacy rate for women is virtually zero. No hospitals, no colleges, no roads. And now the superpower plus the allies bombing them, the national army coming in and bombing them, and Al-Qaeda, the suicide bombers, playing havoc there also. 
and I'll explain why. And you can imagine what these societies are experiencing right now. And yet, what is the current situation? After a decade, over a decade of the war on terror, with trillions of dollars spent, thousands of lives lost, are we really acknowledging, or acknowledging that this paradigm has not worked? And take some of the elements emerging from this war on terror. The constant and distressing pressures that the American military faces with green on blue killings, the suicide rates reaching record proportions, something so high that I, if I was a general in the American army, I'd be really alarmed. Something like 22 veterans of the army committing suicide. And this is the American army, not Pakistan or Afghan army. And the unnecessary killings of Americans, British, Afghans that occur with discouraging frequency. Take the impact on major non NATO allies like Pakistan. Thousands of officers, citizens, civilians dead. Something like 55,000 according to Pakistanis. And high levels of anti-Americanism. Take the situation in Pakistan today where the new prime minister declares that the drones must stop. And Imran Khan, who you know as a cricketing hero, now a major political figure in Pakistan, declares that if he ever became prime minister, the first order would be to the Pakistan Air Force to shoot down the drones. In that situation, you have a drone strike. So the stage is set for a very dramatic, high-level confrontation between two allies who must work together in order for the American troop withdrawal to work with precision and some order. And we have the spillover, the Boston bombings, this uh, terrible tragedy in London. And as a father, as a grandfather, my granddaughter Meena Hoti is here in the audience, I am very concerned because nowhere is safe, no place is safe. And these terrorists do not distinguish, they do not say he's a Muslim, he's not a Muslim, he's this color or that color. They will commit their acts of violence to make a point and I'll get to that uh, and I try to explain why they're doing this. They're doing this really, going back to our tribal studies, because of their mutated distorted understanding of the code of honor. Let me comment on the code of honor. Every one of these tribes, 40 of them, has a particular code and a name, often the same name as the tribe. Among the Pukhtun, it's called Pukhtunwali or Pashtunwali. It emphasizes honor, hospitality, courage, and also revenge. There's a famous saying among the Pukhtun, I took revenge, after a hundred years, and I took it too quickly. So this notion of revenge is very important. And this study clearly established that so many of the acts of groups like the Taliban in Pakistan, the strain in Pakistan, commit these atrocities, these violent acts, I would say of almost insanity, shooting a 10-year-old boy in front of his father, blowing up a busload of women, then following them to a hospital, and when they commit this act, they give a statement and they say, we did this deliberately, so you know the pain we are going through. The day the drone strike took place a few days ago, a few days later, the Taliban killed 10 foreign tourists in Pakistan, saying this is in revenge for that strike. So again, you can see cause and effect, almost with mathematical precision. And again, I maintain, that this violence must be stopped. It must be effectively checked. It cannot be left to just continue this state of drift in which we are in right now. Now going back to tribal society, what is going to stop it? What will check it? Drones, they haven't worked. Central government invasions, sending in the army, that hasn't worked. Migrating out, well, huge sections of these tribal populations are living as destitute refugees in the bigger cities. Destitute. So an already impoverished community is being now destroyed. The reason is that these societies have three pillars of authority. And here I want you to follow this. This is crucial to this talk. The first pillar is the tribal elder. This is the man who is linked with the tribe itself, going back to the common ancestor. The Tribal elders form the jirga, the council of elders. 
they mediate disputes, they contain violence, and over the last thousand years, by and large, they have. Then you have the mullah, the religious figure, in charge of the madrasa and the mosque. And then you have the central government representative. In the case of Pakistan, the political agent, the civil administration represented by the political agent, backed by the military, paramilitary organizations. Now, each pillar, and I want you to listen to this carefully, each pillar has been deliberately targeted and destroyed by the Taliban. And ask yourself, why would they do this? Why aren't they attacking the Americans? Because if you destroy the structure of a society, there is no resistance. And they know that they will not be stopped by drone strikes from outside or the Pakistan army from outside. Because the more the violence, the more recruits they have. The more the anger against the violence. What can check them is that internal structure and that has been demolished. Tribal elders in Waziristan, the place I knew, something like 400 tribal elders have been killed, deliberately killed. And that for tribal society, Tribal societies have small populations. 400 killed means an entire society is decapitated, just killed. It's finished. It doesn't have a head. Religious figures blown up in their mosques. These figures act as people who mediate between warring clans. They are the target. And then the political agent, with all his authority, cannot visit these agencies. He'll be shot. He'll be kidnapped. So you see the pillars of authority have shaken and there is no check to them from internal, uh, within, the, uh, within the structure. And all this begins in 2004 in Waziristan. That is when the drones begin. That is when the Pakistan army launches a full-scale invasion followed by another invasion, followed by a, another invasion. And today you have a situation in Waziristan where something like three and a half thousand people there have been killed as a result of the drones. Now for every one individual killed, the intended quote unquote bad guy, you may have 30 who are totally innocent, women, children. And you'll have 3,000 who then will be furious and angry and ready to join a queue for suicide bombing. And the consequences will be on completely innocent women, children, school children, anyone who they can get, get hold of, who represents the authority of the central government. Where is this violence coming from? If you were to accept the clash of civilizations, as most people do, if you're a journalist looking for answers, you would say Islam. And if that's the case, then you run off and look at the Quran and say verse so-and-so explains why there's violence in Islam, and therefore, by definition, all Muslims are potentially violent or capable of being violent. That is a hugely flawed argument, hugely flawed. Because in every verse that advocates standing up for your rights or defending your community, the next verse is to make peace. It is repeated again and again that God prefers peace over war, again and again, there's no doubt about this. And take a look at some tribal elements in this discussion. Wali Khan, the son of the legendary Frontier Gandhi was asked about his identity. And he said, I have been a Pashtun for 6,000 years, a Muslim for 1,300 years, and a Pakistani, and this was about 1970s, a Pakistani for 25 years. Three categories of identity. He's laid them out for you. The 9-11 hijackers, consider this. 18 of the 19 hijackers were Yemeni tribesmen. 10 of them were from the tribes of the Asir province of Saudi Arabia. The Asir province is completely Yemeni. It was annexed by Saudi Arabia as recently as the 1930s. Bin Laden, tribal background, Yemeni, and his key official said that 90, 95% of Al-Qaeda was Yemeni. So again, tribal, tribal, tribal. Read the rhetoric of Bin Laden. Follow his poetry. It's full of references to tribal raids and warrior and courage and revenge and swords and spears. And the last two houses in which he lived, Gamdi House in Afghanistan, named after a tribe, Yemeni tribe, clan, 
and Waziristan in Abbottabad again ref reflect a tribal affiliation. If he was such an Islamic scholar, he would have surely called these last two houses Makkah House and Medina House. So we have some clues and Bin Laden is throwing them around for us. Alas, we have not picked them up. Now my contention is if the problem is coming and lies in the tribal code, then the solution lies in the tribal code. This is precisely the basis on which I as an administrator conducted my interactions with those tribes and very often faced very similar challenges to faced by Americans, the British and so on today. Except I worked entirely within the tribal structure, as did my predecessors in Pakistan and before during the British times. What is happening today is that relations between the center and the periphery have deteriorated to a relationship of point, counterpoint, attack, counterattack, peace treaties, collapse of treaties. And this cycle of violence is not stopping. It's happening throughout these societies. There is no consistent long-term plan over the last decade to bring stability and peace. And there is an absolute desperate need to have an effective, just, neutral, civil administration and work within the traditional tribal structures. Let me conclude by pointing out that this relationship, the center periphery, has again been overlooked because again, if you're looking at it as a clash of civilizations, you're seeing the West fighting Islam. In fact, take a look at these societies. It really is a clash between the center and the periphery. The problems of Waziristan are not the problems of Washington or London. They are the problems of Islamabad. Waziristan is in the tribal areas of Pakistan. It is up to Pakistan to control those areas. And if you take a look at the other uh, uh, nations, Muslim nations, you'll see similar situation. Turkey with the Kurds, Pakistan I've just given you with the Baloch and the tribal areas, and so on. And also, also non-Muslim nations with Muslim peripheries. China, Uyghur. Russia, Caucasus. Same, center, periphery. Center, periphery. Going back 200 years. But it is more interesting. Take a look at non-Muslim center, non-Muslim periphery. Sri Lanka, Tamils, non-Muslims. Center, non-Muslim. India, Naxalites and Adivasis, non-Muslim, non-Muslim. So this clearly indicates that number one, the center periphery confrontation predates 9-11. And number two, we need to seriously look at it in order to try to resolve this particular period of history. Finally, while it's important for us to analyze this clinically and dispassionately, I have come to the conclusion that we need to really transcend our disciplines that we learn in departments like the excellent one here at SOAS in anthropology. We really need to dig deeper into our own spiritual basis. We need to try to understand who we are as a world civilization. Where are we going as a world civilization? We need to explore our own common spiritual traditions. I am very inspired by sayings from the past. Jesus saying, love one another. Blessed are the peacemakers. By the Sufis and their message of Sule Kul, Sole Kul means peace with all. Or the Jewish sages and their concept of tikkun olam, to heal a fractured world. And to me, at least in these case studies I've given, the world is fractured and it needs healing. So please join me in healing a fractured world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we can all agree that this is uh, an extraordinarily important as well as uh, potentially provocative uh, study. I want to bring in our other colleagues in a moment. Just wanted to ask one question on that. How has this research uh, 
gone down in the United States, uh, given that you're more than familiar with the arguments, which is drone strikes do work, uh, and uh, it saves American lives because they're not put at risk? Well, um, Gavin, this is an interesting question because my team and myself were very committed to helping the United States really to win this war on terror because it has to be won or we're all going to be involved in, in, a, in a sort of quicksand situation. So I was wondering this question because of the title. It seems almost that you're just condemning the United States. On the contrary, we are pointing out with great diligence and scholarship that the United States does have a lot to give on the world stage. The vision of the Founding Fathers, the educational programs, the aid. I myself studied at Burn Hall up in the north of Pakistan and Foreman Christian College in Lahore, which is a very popular educational institution in Lahore even today. Now, how the Americans respond to something like this is clear because so far they've heard the arguments for drones and all the technological arguments why it's so efficient and why it's such an efficient killing machine. They did not really hear the argument connecting it to the people who are at the receiving end. So you hear what happens when the drones go off and keep us safe in America. What you don't hear is what it does to people over there. Uh, and I was really surprised at some of the reactions. The Pentagon invited me twice to give them, uh, it's a very prestigious forum there. General McChrystal spoke just before the time I spoke. Uh, and um, we've had people like Colonel Wilkerson, who was the former chief of staff of uh, Secretary Colin Powell, saying that this is the best book and the only book, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got that response. On the other hand, again, as a scholar, I must be fair, we've also had some scathing criticism. And as my team, uh, we discuss these reviews because we are serious about getting the word out. Uh, it's clear they haven't read the book. They've just seen the title. They said, this is anti-American. This author is called Ahmed, so it's got to be anti-American. And you get some really scathing. One, one comment was from a so-called expert that this is unbelievable drivel. It's so bad that my cat didn't like it. So I didn't know what to make of that. So we've got both ranges. I don't know how seriously we should take that kind of response. OK, let, let me bring in the others. Uh, Professor Ashkar, um, that argument, that central argument that uh, uh, central government control has been weakened, uh, that uh, part of the point of the war on terror is supposed to be uh, to um, help stop the drift towards failed states or failing regions and states. And those three pillars that we talked about of, of, of tribal society being undermined, I just wondered what your thoughts were. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was prepared precisely to, to make some co comments on, uh, on uh, Professor Ahmed's book. And let me first say that I'm very happy to be part of this uh, community meeting and uh, especially uh, with uh, sharing the panel with Professor Ahmed. Uh, I should say that uh, um, uh, I found the book, well, for, first of all, a very uh, pleasant reading because uh, Professor Ahmed is, a, is a, an excellent writer, as, as even a poet, so th this can be reflected, is reflected in the book, so it's a very, very uh, uh, captivating read. And at the same time, a very original combination because of... Uh, of, uh, of your having two hats in this book, one really uh, the anthropologist and the other one the, uh, let's say, the, maybe uh, not the politician, but the, the, the expert in international relations, let's put it uh, this way. And there's this well, rather original combination of these two uh, aspects in, in the book and actually reflected even in the title of the book, this, the binary title here, the sizzle, uh, 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 um, referring to the anthropological dimension of, of the book and of course the drone uh, all, of, of all, all of us know uh, what it is about and I, I should say that uh, 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 one of the uh, surprising aspects for me for the book uh, was to, 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 to read it as almost a praise of, of, uh, of clanism of tribalism uh, I, I should say that uh, the staunch modernist that I am was not completely convinced on this aspect of things, but it, it, it was very much refreshing, very, very stimulating. On the other hand, you have a, a very powerful indictment of uh, the present policies of the, the Obama administration, uh, typified by, by the drone and this very intensive use of, of the drone. And I should say that while reading the book, uh, I mean, I was reminded of uh, 
uh, a picture of uh, the, 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 during uh, last, the last visit by, by the first visit as president by Barack Obama to, to Berlin. There was someone holding a, a big banner or something like that with uh, a Martin Luther King with the caption, I have a dream, and Barack Obama with the caption, I have a drone. <laughs> I, I, I think that was a very, very nice summary of, of, of a major difference between, uh, between, between the, the two men. And, uh, and indeed, uh, I mean, when, when you look at it, and uh, I, I should say really that uh, Professor Ahmed's book uh, really helps even understanding to what extent this is terrible. I mean, the, the, this use of drones and the, the, the effect of it, uh, even beyond what you, you, may, you may imagine. But you see it also as a particularly um, coward use of uh, overwhelming force, uh, as an illustration of what a uh, famous uh, commentator of military affairs in the United States called immediately after the, the, the first Gulf War, the post-heroic war. Uh, this war strikes from a distance, and now it strikes from, from you know, a, a kind of mini planes without even pilots. You know? and, uh, and, and you, 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 you have this uh, very, very, very clearly exposed in, in the book. And this is part of also of a, of a general pattern, which, uh, uh, I mean, one should say uh, that uh, the, the Israel. Uh, um, you resorted to extensively in the in the occupied territories, uh, and uh, which was called with some kind of euphemism as extrajudicial executions, and which are actually plainly assassinations, because you are here uh, killing people, uh, taking the decision to kill people, without, of course, any judiciary uh, process, without even the ability of being 100% sure that you're killing the right person, if ever this person uh, deserves from uh, whatever legal point of view or uh, justice point of view, uh, to, be, to, be, to be killed. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, indeed, I mean, I share uh, uh, Professor Ahmed's uh, um, very critical uh, stance on, uh, on the, the, the clash of civilization kind of thesis. And actually, I myself devoted a book to that which you, you mentioned, Gavin, uh, which came out uh, 12 years ago, actually, immediately after 9-11, which, uh, which was called The Clash of Barbarisms, and in which I explained that civilizations, in the proper sense of the term, cannot clash, if you take the full sense of civilization, civilized, yeah? And that what we, what we are witnessing is actually a clash of barbarisms, or let's say barbaric perversions within civilizations. And this, of course, is pro very, or let's say, is rather obvious, at least in the West, when you say that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda is a perversion of, of Islam or Islamic civilization, or it should be. It's, let's say, it's politically correct to say it that way, even though many people, as Professor Ahmed say, would just refuse even to make that, uh, that distinction. But uh, uh, my, my contention is that uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, what we see also from the American side or from the Western side, uh, developing for many years now, uh, is also a perversion of, of Western civilizations and of all the values of perversion of, uh, of Western civilization. And if we take civilization, the strong word, strong meaning of the term, which means, which refers to the uh, the civitas, the, the Latins, the polis of the Greek, it, it, it's basically the rule of law. It's basically, you know, a, a state based on, 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 you know, civilized relations, which is uh, based on, on rules, uh, and counterposed to the state of nature, to the law of the jungle. And what we have been seeing on the, on the worldwide level is very much the law of the jungle being applied by the, by the strongest, which is always, I mean, to the benefit of the, the most powerful, as we have been uh, seeing with this uh, 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 proliferation of, of, uh, of uh, blatant violations of any sense of international law. Uh, invasions, uh, drone uh, killings, uh, uh, Guantanamo, you mentioned that, uh, Gavin, etc. I mean, uh, there are permanent violations, not to mention Abu Ghraib and the rest. We are seeing this barbaric perversion of Western civilization at work there. And this is what, 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 what we are doing in this kind of dialectics, this kind of interaction between 
two uh, barbarisms, each one feeding the other. And I would say the most powerful is the, 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 the guiltiest in, in this regard because uh, they have the, the power to change this kind of, of relation. And so where I would have, uh, let's say, a different point of view with that of Professor Ahmed is when he comes to his last chapter, which he calls How to Win the War on Terror. Uh, uh, well, on the one hand, I wouldn't even locate myself within this formula, the War on Terror, which is very much loaded, but I, I'm sure Professor Ahmed agrees uh, with that. But uh, I'm looking here at the, uh, the, let's say, kind of policy prescription, the, the, the Waziristan model that you, you, you mentioned. Uh, I think this makes sense, of course, for a legitimate rule. But the first question to ask is, who is applying this model? Who is, tr uh, who, who is asked to deal with tribes? Is it a legitimate rule or is it an illegitimate rule, whether a foreign occupation or a despotic kind of, of regime. If, if we don't ask this question, then we are giving recipes for, it, when it comes to the United States, uh, for, for imperial power. Uh, and these are recipes, and one should say that this country applied, for instance, in Iraq, uh, after the First World War, uh, very much played the divide and rule uh, kind of game with the, the, the tribes. And uh, the United States itself, in, uh, uh, in, uh, after 2006 in Iraq, resorted to these same kind of policies of buying the tribes through the elders and all that, through money, $300 per, per man, and creating large, uh, they called it awakening, uh, sahwats, uh, uh, kind of, of uh, tribal supplements of, of the, the, uh, the US Army. But all that just increased, if you want, the, 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 our, uh, contributed to, to, to planting the seeds of what has become a totally, you know, uh, I mean, uh, tragic society. Iraq, uh, Iraq is in a very, very tragic uh, situation. So uh, I think that, uh, in my view, the most basic question, but I'm sure on this we, we can't disagree, is that the, the real antidote to terror, in, in whatever form of terror, state terror or non-state terror, non-NG terror, eh? non-governmental terror, uh, uh, is, I, I would say, the rule of law, is against civilization. And, and here, the responsibility is mostly and above all that of the most powerful. And in that regard, Professor Ahmed uh, quoted uh, uh, Kennedy in his, in his book. Uh, I have my reservations about Kennedy as a model. But uh, there's a, definitely another American president which uh, we can refer to, Franklin Roosevelt, and his vision, which went far beyond anything Kennedy has said, and which was embodied in the UN Charter and the very conception of the UN. And here is the only so-called, the only basis of international legality that we have. And if we don't apply this, we'll never get out of, of terror. Professor Ashkar, thank you very much. Um, Arshin. Yeah, Gavin, I, I can pick up your, your question of uh, the, the nation state and the core periphery theme that, that um, Professor Ahmed talked about. It's in, indeed an interesting question. I think one of the things that has been, you know, that we are witnessing in the past decade or so is uh, the erosion of, of the nation state as we knew it. I mean, this is in many ways a relic of modernity, right, introduced um, through the violence of colonialism to the region. In a region, as Professor Ahmed uh, rightly said, people were really living beyond borders, right, uh, a region whether it is Western Asia or South Asia that is pregnant with um, civilizations, ethnicities, where people got used to live um, without the concept of, of rigid space in mind. Um, and that goes back to exactly what Professor Ahmed said about, about tribes who are also used to live um, beyond borders. And what we're seeing, certainly in West Asia, as, as Gilbert also indicated, is um, the erosion of these nation states. There is no concept of a homogeneous nation in that, in that area. So you have wars within states, within nations, in Iraq and Syria, in uh, you know, the Kurdish problem that Professor Ahmed uh, talked about and within Pakistan, Afghanistan, because there is simply no consensus about what it means, for instance, to be Afghan, 
to be Pakistani even, right? There are competing identities that always impinge on that. But we have the problem here as well with the Scots, right? You, you mentioned the Scots uh, as, as a... Leave us out of it. We've had enough trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not entirely confined to that region. I'm saying that this, this is in many ways part of the problem of the nation state as it appeared in, in modernity. And people are, are, are struggling with that. But let me pick up the point of, of spaces and people living beyond and uh, yeah, beyond spaces. It's interesting. There's an interesting paradox here because drone warfare really is meant to make the enemy invisible, right? And open up new spaces for us to you know, target or assassinate or whatever. Um, it makes essentially every single citizen of a country a potential target. This is what technology has has turned into these days. Um, so these drones really claim in many ways those invisible spaces that those very tribes claim for their, for their livelihood. So that, that's the strange paradox here, that we have the drones on the one side claiming and targeting those spaces that the very tribes claim for themselves. And indeed, it came out in the, in the, in the poem at the, at, the, at, the, at the beginning beautifully, um, where you had, really, I mean, my immediate reaction was, it turned the Khaybar Pass into something entirely invisible, a theater of war into something visible. That was the beauty of it. And I think the beauty of books in general that deal with, with those enemies that we don't see, and Professor Ahmed mentioned 3,500. What are their names? You know, who are they? And we, don't, we don't even have, in terms of, of organization, one of the strengths of, of Western civilization has always been to, to enumerate and things. And we don't even have their names. We don't have their identity. So the beauty of books um, such as this is really that it gives an identity to the enemy, minimizing the claims to, to dehumanize the enemy. And that goes back, of course, to the whole notion of the, of the barbarian threatening us, you know, our, our civilized police from the outside. Um, it, that was always a strategy to dehumanize the enemy in order to mobilize the nation or the civilization uh, against, uh, against that enemy. So, I mean, these are, these are some, of the, some of the themes. So maybe something about the, 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 what I would call the, the dialectics of, of violence in, the, in this whole um, uh, discourse of the war on terror. Um, it really created self-fulfilling prophecies. I mean, for everyone studying maybe politics, this is, this is quite interesting. It was an idea, right? A speechwriter came up with the idea. I think it was David Frum, but mm -hmm. you would know better. Uh, I think him. it was him. It was Frum, wasn't it? It was Frum, yeah. Frankie? Was it Frum? Did he confess? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they wrote uh, the, the book with Richard Pearl, where they, where I think it was called The Fight Against Evil, where they, where they essentially said the war on terror is the war against you-know-who. And that was in parentheses, of course, Muslims. So, you know, they, because they're politically correct, they couldn't say it. But um, so it, it, it developed out of uh, the mind of a speechwriter. Then it turned into uh, a speech by the president, into a salient norm with institutions and budgets attached to it. And then it created a self-fulfilling prophecy because it was then appropriated by other people as well. So suddenly you had Putin talking about the war on terror um, against the Chechens. You had you know, Chinese uh, politicians talking about the war on terror in Western China against the Uyghurs in, in, in Xinjiang province. Or indeed, I heard the Turkish finance minister talking about terrorists on Taksim Square, that this is a war on terror. So you know, this is what happens with 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 ideas, this is the kind of the genealogy of ideas, and this is how politics then works. And this is then going back to the, to the conclusion, how we deal with international relations. I've always said that rhetoric, words, are at the heart of it, right? That you know that you have to be responsible when you're in power, and, and that you use responsible, responsible rhetoric. And unfortunately, with the Bush administration, we didn't, we didn't have that. I think Obama is by far more, um, shall I say, intellectually capable to, to frame things in a different way. Um, but you know, he certainly has a different rhetoric. And I believe personally that had, it, it at least had, has lent itself to a different form of, of engagement. Hasn't solved certainly the problems that we're dealing with, but it has opened up spaces for diplomatic engagement. I shall leave it at that. I think it's good to have a dialogue about these issues with the 
with the people here as well. Indeed, and I think, uh, I think we've got a microphone up there. Uh, I don't know whether uh, anybody would like to uh, be the first to ask a, a question. Yes, sir, um, we can get the microphone to you. Professor Akbar Ahmed, it is good to listen to you once again. Mushtaq Lishari, Chairman, Third World Solidarity. Uh, you know we are working for peace, tolerance, and uh, justice in the world. I think it is good to know your explanation on tribal and global, global versus tribal. But I think the word terrorism by itself is a new phenomenon after 9-11. It used to be called freedom fighters. And I think it is very important to understand it, that the terrorism in Ireland, in Spain, in many parts of the world have been going on for many, many decades. And I think it is very important to say that you cannot fight the terrorism without fighting the root causes of terrorism. And I think uh, Professor uh, uh, Achar has just mentioned that one of the root causes of terrorism, whether it is a tribal or otherwise, which you have mentioned, it is Palestine is one of them. Other injustices and double standard by the Western world on foreign policy is another one. There are United Nations resolution being put on statute books for past 60, 70 years is not implemented. When it is in their interest, it is implemented with days, even invading the country. I think it is very important to just say something of that, that root causes are also very important with understanding the terrorism, which is new and totally 10, 12 years uh, 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 old. Thank you. Uh, let me bring in Professor yeah. Ahmed on that. Thank you. Uh, let me um, respond to my friend Lashari first. And thank you for the work you do in creating uh, bridges. In fact, this is the third part of a trilogy. The first book, Journey into Islam, resulted after an extended trip into the Muslim world, again with my young American team. And in that book, we looked at how Muslims were seeing the West and the main problems, and all these problems you're talking about came in that book, reflecting popular Muslim opinion. Muslim opinion in cities, in bazaars, on university campuses. The second book was Journey into America. Again, I took my sabbatical, I took my nine months, and traveled throughout the United States. 75 cities, we went to 100 mosques. This is a very detailed study of contemporary Muslim society in the United States. And there we looked at how Americans were looking at Muslims and all the um, ideas they had, stereotypes, uh, fears, and so on. Now, this book, Le Shai Saab, focuses exclusively on the tribal areas and tribal societies. So I'm leaving out the earlier discussion, which already has been mentioned. Do you need to remember that? Uh, which means read the other two books. <laughs> now. <laughs> In terms of uh, my distinguished colleagues, some very interesting points have been raised. And I very briefly, Gavin, with your Please. permission, because these are serious points. The issue of law and justice is at the heart of tribal society. Please do not underestimate it. Just because these people are lit illiterate in a formal sense, they don't have the education, say, their counterpart would have in a city, the notion of justice the notion of law is vital. In fact, the entire society functions around what they understand as law, which is tribal law. And to my mind, Mr. Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, extraordinary man of the law, he emphasized human rights, women's rights, minority rights, the rule of law. Of course, that didn't quite work out for Pakistan, but that was his vision. And for the tribal areas, he emphasized the same thing, law and justice. And two tribes fighting with each other will go to war or stop fighting if they're guaranteed justice between them. It's a vital, why? Because go back to the three pillars I talked about. These tribal societies are all intensely egalitarian. It's like the Scots. Each one believes he's as good as the next man. And they're not going to accept anyone superimposing an authority, certainly backed by the outside. So in the ideal, they would want egalitarianism to be practiced. The point about using the concept of war on terror and winning the war on terror, as an anthropologist, I'm simply reflecting what the normative 
term is for what's going on. This is what the term is, this is what's used by the media, and I'm flipping it around. I'm standing it on its head. I'm saying, if this is a war, how do you win this war? This is how you win the war. I'm not agreeing to the term. Again, in the previous two books, we have spent a lot of uh, time debating the use of these terms. In terms of um, your point about tribal societies and, and they're really being voiceless, this is a very important point. I want to emphasize that I in no way am an advocate in the sense I don't come from those tribal societies. I do not represent them. I have not taken any money from them or any favors. I am motivated purely by the fact that I am in the knowledge of human suffering on a very large scale. And I cannot, in all consciousness, allow myself silence. I do not have that luxury. That is why I'm speaking out, at sometimes at great cost to myself. But I will point out, when I interacted, I represented the central government. Now, this meant that I had the privilege of having both perspectives. And I found in this war on terror that these people are actually voiceless. You are not going to see a wazir or a masood on the BBC. You're not going to be in, in, hearing an interview. You will hear experts talking about them. You'll hear experts saying how much they love being hit by the drone. I've heard this myself. I have, Gavin. I've heard Pakistani saying this. The tribesmen love the drone. How do they love the drone? Which community would want to be destroyed because we love the drone? It's not some cute and cuddly thing coming from overseas because it may bring a visa or something to us. It is, it is death and destruction. You know, this is such an important, but it's being made. Now, when this book came out, Again, as an anthropologist, the test is, how do the people you're writing about respond? Not so much the critics who may like it or not like it for all kinds of reasons, but the people you're describing. That is the test. Are you depicting them accurately? And I was gratified and thrilled to get endorsement after endorsement after endorsement. A Baloch writer from Balochistan, actual Baloch, wrote that after a decade, and this is in the dawn, you can Google him, his name is Malik Siraj, he said, after a decade, for the first time, the voiceless people of the periphery have found a voice. Because I'm simply reflecting their opinion, I'm not creating an opinion. So I'm not romanticizing or saying they're perfect, they're wonderful people, we should be like them. I'm in fact pointing out the problems, the treatment of women, the treatment of minorities, the sense of internness, all this has to change. Their leaders have to bring their communities into the 21st century. But surely we must not end up by destroying entire communities. And um, my final point here is that really to ultimately find answers, <coughs> it is the central government very much involved. It is the periphery very much involved. It is the West very much involved. So you're looking at a triangle. This relationship is not bilateral. It is a triangle. And that triangle has become a war of terror, a triangle of terror. And this is where the West becomes crucial. This is where, Gavin, figures like you become crucial. Because if you don't get involved in the debate and discussion, the other two points are not going to be discussed. And they're overlooked in the debate in the West where the debate is very different, is restricted, but this is a global problem, and the triangle of terror is a global triangle affecting hundreds of millions of people. Okay, let's have some more questions from the floor. There's, uh, there's a gentleman there, there's a lady at the front. Uh, who's got a microphone? Yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk, and my apologies for arriving late. Um, my name's John Paul, I'm from the Hammer Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence in St. Andrews. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and I have a couple of points and interesting uh, questions to ask. Um, firstly, yeah, no, let's get, stick with the questions. Um, there's, I'm going to sound critical here, but I'll have to keep it simple. Um, where do you stand on Ishad Manji's views that the situation about Islam as, and its relationship to terrorists and the origins of terrorism is more complex than you present. I'm very much a, a friend of, uh, of Muslims and Islam and, and what we might call very badly the moderates. Um, but I think the situation is much more complex and Islam as a religion is not heterogeneous. Um, its views on war and peace are not as simple as you seem to have portrayed in your talk or at least the parts I caught. 
Um, and I think that's part of the complexity of the problem we, we look at. Um, and the other thing is this concept of centers and peripheries is again, I think, an oversimplification. Because if we look at Pakistan, um, it is a center not of a, a stable state, but it is also a root of terrorism against other states and other centers of authority. Um, it is a root of terrorism against its own, as you've rightly pointed out, as, of its own tribal areas. But again, a form of terrorism that is of not kind of a, an American super state form, but the army, for example, is a state within a state, and the role of the ISI in that. Um, right. I, I, sorry to cut you off, but I think you've made your point clearly. Yes, um, John, thank you for those questions. Uh, the first one I didn't quite get. Are you suggesting that Irshad Manji is saying that we should interpret Islam in a different way? I'm not sure I'm getting your question. She, is, she says there's a crisis of identity and that parts of... Um, sorry, she's a, a Muslim Canadian writer and she says that um, there's a crisis of identity in Islam at the moment. C um, could I just interrupt there? Because I've interviewed her and asked her for, before she wrote that, which Muslim countries had she visited as a Canadian Muslim, and she told me none. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure she's a great <laughs> expert. Irshad Manji, I wouldn't actually quote. John but Paul, anyway, please, uh, yeah. please read, please there's read. A lot of scholarship, actually. John, you know. please read Akba S. Ahmed and drop the others. And, uh, <laughs> and you'll be fine. The second one, I don't really understand your question, center, periphery, Pakistan. Pakistan, my friend, I've been in the field. Pakistan has had a very poor record of treating the periphery. In 1971, its poor record led to the breakup of the country. And in its mind, Islamabad, although minority in terms of population, very much thought it was the center dealing with the periphery and sent in the army. No dialogue, send in the army. And in some senses, it's making the same mistake in Baluchistan. I would say it's the classic center-periphery situation. Whether it's a strong center, weak center, the pattern is there. It's the pattern we are trying to dig out. And in terms of simplification, uh, John Gavin said, you cannot speak more than 25 five minutes or you'll get a drone. So I had to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> Again, read the book and you'll be happy. You have lots of details, uh, lots okay. of details. Thank you very much. Uh, who else do we have? Somebody down there? Yes, a gentleman there. And there's a lady at the front, if we can get down here, too. David Scarpa. How dangerous is it to draw red lines? Uh, David, in what context are you talking about? Well, David, um, uh, fortunately, he has drawn the red line, but as you see from his record, President Obama, uh, he tends to be flexible about the red line, keeps moving. So luckily, <laughs> it isn't like Bush, who actually means that this is a red line. If you cross it, I'm coming. That's one, one observation. Secondly, again, on a very different scale, much more limited, but I found in my tribal dealing, dealings, and I was commissioner of three divisions in Balochistan, and several agencies in the tribal areas that you cannot really have red lines. If you want your objective, if you want your man, as it were, in one case, a very famous uh, man I wanted, he, had, he was kidnapping uh, Pakistan army officials and crossed into Afghanistan. You have to be very patient. You have to really play chess. You cannot play baseball. You can't go bang, slam, and come out of it. You've got to be very, very patient. You've got to build up your case. You've got to build up a network of tribal allies who then begin to act to put pressure on the guy and then get him when you want him, on your terms. And therefore, red lines become counterproductive. And that's what you see in history. You see these great uh, figures of history who were very successful generals after the war, when they're able to negotiate with the enemy, not by drawing red lines, but by crossing red lines. Alexander the Great, my favorite example. He's conquered Afghanistan, Persia, he comes into India, and he fights that terrible battle on the Jhelum River with King Porus, the king of India. And it is devastating for the Greek army, already, already tired, exhausted, loss of men and lives, and fed up of the wars. They want to go home. And they want King Porus to be punished. Red line, they said, this man has cost us so heavily, he must be humiliated and tortured and crucified and so on. 
And Alexander calls him in court in chains and he asks King Porus, how do you want to be treated? And David, the famous answer is, like a king. Now, here's Alexander. He could have said, blast him, torture him, how cheeky. In fact, Alexander says, so you shall come and sit next to me. And in an instant, David, no red lines, he converts his main enemy in, in India into his main ally. He says, not only will you represent me, but I'm going to increase your uh, kingdom. And suddenly his flank, as he's withdrawing, remember he's withdrawing his troops, is guarded. Right now, the United States slash Britain and NATO troops are planning to withdraw next year. This is when you need the strongest allies in the region. Because if you have turmoil, you'll have problems for them. So again, I hope that people are appreciating that we are giving arguments and suggestions for a more stable world and a more peaceful one. Thank you. Lady. I just wanted to ask, has, has there been in history um, any times uh, when l like the law and uh, justice that you have, pre uh, you have told us about existed or has that always been an ideal? And the idea of this law and justice, isn't it relative? And how could these points be met so that both sides are happy with it? I think that's a very good question because it's a question that challenges all of us. Certainly for me, looking for an ideal in society, where do we find it? What example? You know, people ask me, all right, you're talking about Islam and Muslims. And I have to give answers. All right, show me one society in the world with a genuine working Islamic model. And I can't. Where can I give an example from? But what I can say is that there are certain periods in history, there are certain individuals in history living up to this ideal, whether in the West or the East. Take the West. Uh, you mentioned uh, Benjamin Franklin and so on, Roosevelt. Go back to the founding fathers of the United States. And they're incredible people. Now we know that there's slavery and the women have no rights, etc., etc. But take their vision of justice and their vision of law. And please read Washington, read Jefferson, read Benjamin Franklin. And you'll be amazed. This is, remember, is the late 18th century. And look what's happening in the 18th century. You have a king here in Britain. You've got uh, oriental despots in the rest of the world. And here you have Jefferson absolutely swearing by the law. No deviation, no compromise. And the discussion on torture is fascinating. Washington is find, founding a state. And he's in the middle of a battle where he may lose that state. He's not winning all the battles. You know, he's in fact at a point where there may be no United States. He may not be able to win that one. And they capture some British soldiers. And these American soldiers say, these people have been torturing us. We are going to do the same to them. Here you have a question of law, justice. How do you treat the enemy? Do you torture or don't you torture? Washington, in the middle of a war, for the survival of his country, says, no. We must maintain the high moral ground. We cannot be like the enemy. No, I think that's incredible. That's in the 18th century. So... In the 21st century, what happened to us? Are we abandoning a vision which we had and practice in the 18th century? And now we are coming up with all justifications how to break the law. So I see this really as an ideal in human society where we must constantly remind ourselves and aspire to. And people have, people have constantly in history aspired. Take Ashoka, take Gandhi, I'm talking of South Asian examples. Gandhi, who at the height of the rioting against the Muslims, 1947-1948, actually goes into those areas and begins a fast unto death. And he doesn't condemn anyone. He says, I have failed. And he begins a fast at that age, a very frail man, not in good health. And the rioting stops. Now here's an, a man with a vision. You have Ashoka, the famous Ashoka, the Indian uh, ruler, Again, in the war of Kalinga, the famous war, a hundred thousand people are killed. He's victorious. He's won the war. But he asks himself, what sort of a victory is this? I've killed a hundred thousand people. He renounces war. He renounces violence. He becomes a Buddhist. 
So you have examples of hu in human history which inspire us and we must share them and we must cherish them. Thank you. I think we've also add Nelson Mandela, who's in our thoughts yes, today no. as well. Uh, let me see who else we can get. There's a gentleman at the front uh, and one at the back. A gentleman here and one at the back. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, you gave a very brilliant thesis with such uh, extraordinary lucidity. Uh, I, I actually wanted to uh, ask uh, one thing. You mentioned that there are uh, Islamic center, Muslim center and Muslim periphery, and there's non-Muslim center and Muslim periphery, and then there are uh, non-Muslim center and non-Muslim periphery. In, in these cases, when we look at it, that most of those non-Muslim peripheries uh, seem to uh, keep those violence localized. Is, is that the Islam, the ingredient which uh, uh, transformed these local, peripheral and central issues into global issue? A good question because we thought a lot about it. You know, when you have 40 cases, you're looking at the globe. Take the Tamil Tigers. Now, the violence wasn't localized. If you remember, it crossed into India. It actually took the life of a prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi. So. <clears throat> These local movements very quickly become international, and we are living in the age of globalization. We have the media, we have transport, we have communications. It's very easy to convert that as an ally in your cause. Why the Muslims get involved globally is simply because <clears throat> after 9-11, we have the United States being involved, the Western allies being involved, and becomes a global war. And because of this understanding, this frame that we are stuck in, this clash of civilizations, and it's not the only narrative, but it is a very important meta-narrative, if you like, we are stuck with it. And unless we can get out of it, and unless the scholars and the intellectuals in the West begin to say that this is empty, it's not led us to anything, it doesn't explain anything, it's like the war on terror, it's meaningless, we will not end this violence, because in the meantime, all the factors and causes of the violence are continuing. So if the drones are stopped today, in Waziristan, the violence will continue because you still have the army, you still have the suicide bombers, you still have tribal rivalries. So you've got to create structures that stop this and those structures must include justice and law. Without that, those societies cannot function. The problem is, and John Paul, I'm coming back to Islam, that every Muslim carries in their mind a map of what an ideal society is and justice and law are absolutely vital for a Muslim. And he looks at the world today and he says, I do not get just justice and I do not get the law. And he has no confidence in the structure of government. And he already is coming to this world with a lot of anger and a lot of resentment. And all you need is that flash and you have something terrible happening. And you see this happening again and again. And again, our leaders, our community leaders, our social leaders in the Muslim community, and that's why the work of people like Lashari becomes so vital. They must be constantly one step ahead of the community, or we'll see, unfortunately, more tragic situations in the future. Thank you. I think we've got time for just, just one more question. It's from the front. I wonder if I can put a joint question to Arshina and Gilbert. Uh, we talked about the drones uh, for obvious reasons today, but I wonder, uh, if we can have uh, the reaction to renditions, particularly Gilbert's reference to clash of barbarism uh, and how within that framework uh, he sees uh, the awful practice of renditions. Um, and, and also Arshin talked about uh, violence of the drones leading to a crisis of or loss of identity. If a, a, a citizen comes from a country where the authorities are involved in awful acts of abduction and torture uh, beyond their you know, territories. Uh, the enemy effectively becomes nameless. I mean, you can't def if, if you have a feeling that you can be abducted in any airport, anywhere, you are blindfolded by people you, don't, you have no idea who they are. And for months and years, there will be debate as to who was present or who was uh, attending your interrogation when you were blindfolded and you didn't even know which territory you were on. Uh, I just want to invite your reflections on 
uh, the impact of renditions on identity of the, uh, uh, the victims. Juba? Um, yeah, thank you, Hassan. Uh, well, you know, rendition is, is, is not really new. I mean, people believe that is something of the very last few years. Uh, actually, I dealt with rendition in my, the book I mentioned, which was published immediately after 9-11. And that was based on New York Times articles about rendition, which preceded 9-11. So it's, it's not a new policy. Th that's one of the means of circumventing the law. And this, I mean, practicing, you know, uh, uh, violations of, of legal norms, of your civilizational norms, by extra extraterritoriality. It's the, the, how to say, the, the, I mean, uh, Guantanamo may, may stand as a metaphor for that. It's a total violation of all human rights. Well, any, any conception of law, people just held like that for, for uh, eternity in, in, in prison. But it is possible to do so because it is out of the territory. And the same goes with the, the uh, you know, extrajudicial killings, assassinations, and all that. So we have a whole set of, of, of hypocrisy which makes uh, the, the very claim by Western powers of representing international legality or abiding by international legality completely you know, discredited in the eyes of, of, of the average uh, citizen in, uh, in the global south. Not to, I mean, actually, in, even in the eyes of many citizens in, the, in our own countries here, I mean, in, in, in the West itself. And I just see this opportunity to, 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 to say that uh, for the person who, as far as I understood, mentioned that, uh, uh, or quoting Ishad Menji, that, uh, uh, that there is some uh, content in Islam which is, uh, you know, which makes it prone to violence or, or this kind of views. Uh, I mean, this can only come from people who have never read the Bible. Because the Bible is a terribly violent book. I mean, there are, I mean, the, the very, uh, I mean, without the term, but the very idea of genocide is to be found in the Bible. So what? I mean, this is completely unhistorical kind of, of reading, which, which believes that because you have a certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, narration in, in history, that this is the source of, of the present uh, uh, and actual uh, uh, conduct of, of those beholding these religions. This is definitely not the case. This is not... Definitely not the reason, and uh, I mean, uh, I think Professor Ahmed himself quoted in his book, uh, uh, at some point, uh, I mean, the, the very different landscape you would have in Islamic lands in the 50s and 60s, and all that, that this image of, uh, of, uh, of peace. I, I was reading recently the narration by a British woman who, uh, that was in the 50s, I think, went through biking uh, mm. to, um, to India or something like that, and she was describing how, how, how hospitable yes. all the countries, the Islamic countries through which she has gone, were. So, I mean, this, this just points to the fact that if we are to, to, to find the roots of what's happening today, it's not, they are definitely not in religion. Hashim? Yeah, well, I, I really won't reply to, to, to that because, it, I mean, it's, it's wrong on so many levels. You don't, you don't get, but, you, yeah, but you're quoting her, so, you know, there's, yeah, but you don't find answers. You don't now, find guys. It. Let's leave him alone. Yeah, let's leave no, John Paul no, alone. I think you don't find answers to <laughs> we'll to, to these phenomena in in religious books. These are political phenomena. So if you you know if you study political science, you will find the answers in, in, in politics. No, no, hold on, hold but on. We, 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 we've dealt enough with Ashin uh, Maji. Thank you very but, much. But just, the, no more. Thank you. About That's the enough. issue of of rendition, um, I think what really happened at some stage is that. Um, political elites in the United States came to the conclusion that as a, as a democracy with a vibrant civil society, it is very necessary to conduct a new type of war when you create these, these areas of lawlessness where people are essentially invisible, as you rightly said. And this is exactly how you can conduct a war these days, to create these, these states of exemption um, in order to, to essentially fight a war without legal repercussion, without any issue of, of, of identity appearing, without actual victims. And this is also how you can, how you can sell a war. Now, there is huge literature on the, the legal implications of this. I mean, the, the very term combatant was created in order to have a term that goes beyond any kind of legal framework that we have. I should say, I mean, my, my 
colleague, Lali Khalili, just wrote a book about that, and you know, it's, it's a brilliant book, and it covers all the aspects. But really, for me, it's also a new way of, of democracies waging wars that can be sold to a very, very skeptical, skeptical public. In the age of non-ideology, where we can't kind of legitimate our, our wars abroad through ideology, I think at some stage, political elites um, came to the conclusion that this is the only way. Okay, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank our distinguished panel and especially Professor Ahmed. Uh, um, just as you were talking there, it struck me that we have become technologically considerably more advanced than we have been over the past few hundred years, but morally perhaps we may have regressed. The, if my American history is correct, in 1863 Lincoln signed into law the Lieber Code forbidding torture within the US Army. That was in 1863 when his country could have fallen apart. So thank you very much, and particularly thank you to Professor Ahmed for making us think. Thank you. Thank you.